Well, hi to our audience today. We're back with our Tech Expertise series, and we are, um, if I can say, delighted <laughs> to have Dana Dunbar, but I truly am. Dana, I, I love that you come from the tech world, and we caught your interest in the management world now for years, and it's just so exciting for all the small landlords out there to have someone like Dana in this space just looking to the future, right, and looking to all the new technology. So. Before I get too excited, I'm going to let you explain a little bit about what that means. Great. Yes. Oh, and I, I, I'm sorry. And I didn't introduce you as being part of Hemlane. Sorry. So it's Dana Dunbar from Hemlane, which is most important because that's a solution for the do-it-yourself investor. Very Cor cool. sorry. Correct. Thanks, Linda. And thanks so much for having me on your show. Um, it's great to be on the show. And um, one of the things I know you and I have always spoken about it and related to is that property management is one of those things where the only people who go into it are those who have um, a breadth of knowledge and expertise because you really do need to be an expert um, throughout both um, the sales process as well as the operational process. And um, that was something that attracted me to it to see how we could bring technology um, to the property management industry. Um, to begin with my background, um, so I've been in technology. I was on the business side for new product introductions at Apple. So our team was responsible for things that were coming out five to 10 years down the road. And one of the most exciting things I saw with Apple was that we were always on the forefront of technology. We weren't worried to you know, cannibalize existing products that we had in the market. All we wanted to do was make a difference in people's lives. And the biggest takeaway that I took from Apple was user experience and how we always had this in Apple, we always had this mindset that we wanted to surprise and delight our customers. And in property management, um, I was at dinner, then actually, let me back up from Apple, I went to home technology. So I went to Nest, which is the home, they make the home thermostat the camera, um, the security camera, as well as the smoke detector, um, the Nest Alarm. And from there, uh, I was at dinner with some friends and we were talking about property management um, and how difficult it is as an investor to be able to manage your properties or to give up that control. And what I noticed hands down was no one was giving up control 80%. We were like 80% of real estate investors who were, were doing the property management ourselves, but you just didn't realize the amount of work and effort it went into it. And when something went wrong, it wasn't that one person was right and one person was wrong. It was a misunderstanding. And so, you know, fast forward today, uh, my company, Hemlane, uh, we are a technology platform for real estate investors, real estate owners, uh, to help them with their property management. Um, but we try to foster that communication, making sure everything's transparent, making sure both the tenants and the owners are satisfied. Tenants are your customer with the Me Too generation that we see of all of those renters um, in their 20s. They want it, do it for me. And, um, you know, they expect a certain level of quality. And so we built that into the technology to make sure that on both sides, it was a much easier experience and that we could delight our customers that way. Yeah, I, you know, I can't, I'm so impressed by, you know, the, first of all, the research, the conversations we've had. I think that's what stands out for you, Dana, is not only the user experience you put together, um, but also the quality of the experience. I, Dana is, I'll call it a quality person um, and, and evident in everything she does and the details. And I think it's very evident in your software. And I just think it's such an opportunity to share this with people that don't know solutions like yourself exist and, and to see the, the type of platform you've put together from, you know, from the a moment of inception, I'll say, from deciding I want to rent this unit all the way through the uh, you know lease. And it's just really, it's an incredible experience. Dana even, I, I'm jumping around a little bit, but I have to say she even jumped into the whole accounting piece to make it for what I'll call non-accountants, you know? And I love that you said that, like we're, we've got it covered, but we've got it covered in language that they understand. That's exactly. That. Our goal is to say you don't have to be the expert. You don't have to actually understand how everything works. 
you almost have to trust it. And it's like an Apple product. It's very easy and simple on the front end, but complex on the back end. You don't have to know how many APIs we have to all these listing websites and how the security and fraud detection works. And um, you know, from the perspective of getting leases, why the California lease is different than the Colorado lease. All you have to know is that this is the best process for you. And um, we are trying to make sure that you have those, the advantage and the tools and the resources that local professionals, um, such as traditional property managers also have, um, because we're still seeing that 80% are self-managing. So how do you provide those tools to them, as well as the resources and the connections they may need? Yeah, absolutely. And in, in fact, from that perspective, if we start somewhat linear, why don't you talk about all the things you've done to help them on the market again, that the, as you said, the average landlord isn't an expert in everything and how you help them with the back end, like the SEO stuff that, yeah, they hear the term, they know it exists, <laughs> but you're putting it to, I'll call it giving it power. You're making it work for them. Great. Yes. So um, one of the things, Linda, you and I can always relate to is in property management, you're a jack of all trades. You have to be good at sales, doing the open houses and selling the property to the tenants. You have to be good at marketing to acquire those tenants and express and get their interest in it. Um, you also have to have a legal degree to some extent of knowing lease contracts and what the terms and the clauses mean. Um, then accounting, right? Accounting background to do the financials and an operations background. Um, so if we start with just the marketing and the first step in the process, which is tenant acquisition, finding a tenant. Um, a lot of people out there don't know what SEO is and it, it stands for search engine optimization. But essentially it's just saying, I want my property to rank at the top. And depending on what the tenant types in, there's something called um, long tail keywords. A tenant might type in, I'm looking for an apartment in San Francisco. Another tenant might type in, I'm looking for a rental in San Francisco. Based on those two different ones, Google is going to um, rank you diff differently. So in the first example, I'm looking for an apartment in San Francisco. Apartments.com is going to rank number one. Usually apartment list is number two, depending on the city. And then other websites like Zillow may be farther down. Um, then um, on the flip side, if they're saying I'm looking for a rental in San Francisco, typically Zillow has that one and they're in position number two, followed by Truly and Hot Pads. As an owner, you shouldn't have to know that. All your goal is, is to be on every website. So regardless of what a tenant types in, your property shows. And um, so that's one of the first steps in the process is just saying, you click a button and we're going to send this out to 40 rental listing websites. We're even going to catch those long tail end keywords. So when you look at your um, demand for your rental property and how many tenants are interested in, in it, you can never ever use the excuse that someone didn't see your property. It's a pricing issue. It's something to do with the property and the amenities that you offer or, you know, the aesthetics of it, but it's nothing to do with your marketing. We want you to put your best foot forward. And that's why we work with every um, rental listing uh, website out there to make sure that you do have your best foot forward. You know what, and, and I so agree, Dana, because I do believe, as you spoke of that 80% do-it-yourselfers, they have a big challenge when it comes to, one of my own daughters moved out of state, so it was an area we didn't know, and they yep. have a big challenge when they go to those syndicated sites, of course, the big syndicated apartment buildings, the multi-families, they jump to the top, so to have, I'll call it someone like Dana and Hemlane on your side, um, to kind of like say, I'll call it fight through that and make sure you get recognized. I think that's key. I think that's, you know, it's absolutely a big selling feature that you've got somebody that understands it and, and can help you choose the right words that will get you there. And that, that's great. That's really great. And with that in mind, why don't we just move a little bit into then, you know, now all of a sudden these inquiries are coming in and uh, where's their sales team, let's say, you know, let's kind of yeah. get into the, the sale, like we've got to close the sale. So you've done a good job, you get us up to the top. 
now what can you what can you suggest I do right? <laughs> Yep, absolutely. So um, just think about, uh, um, I assume everyone watching this has some property management and landlording experience. Think about when you need a service professional. Something's broken and uh, you know you say, okay, I need a, a licensed, bonded, and insured um, electrician right? Or, you know, your, your lights aren't working. Um, you go out and you literally reach out to all of them. The first one to respond with a reasonable price, <laughs> who sounds like they're on top of it. You're like, great. When can you come over? They're like, I can come over tomorrow. Fantastic. You stop right there. You don't go and research, you know, other people. It's a speed game, they say. Yeah, I like it's, that. It's the same with tenants. They, they, when they reach out to your property, so 84% of tenants, according to Zillow, 84% 84, um, 84 of tenants are searching online. When they search online, they're not going to show interest in your property. They're not going to inquire unless they're truly interested in it. So they probably say, okay, we're interested in three or four properties. They're going to inquire about all of them, right? Sure. Well, obviously, the first one to respond to say, great, when can you view the property? That's going to be the one that says, wow, this landlord sounds like they're on top of it. Right. You know, if I have a maintenance issue, I can imagine they're going to be just on, as on top of it as they are today. And so while we send to the landlords, here's the, the lead. We call them leads. So they're tenants who are interested in your property. Here's the lead. But we also pick up that the tenant just said, hi, I'm interested in a showing. And we send your showing calendar to them. When you have showings of when you can show them the property. Of course, we put a caveat in there that says, if you're not interested in any of these um, times, if they don't work for you, please reach out and we can find another time. But for 82% of the tenants, they're going to respond to that and book a showing because the times are going to work for them, assuming you have, you know, it's not at 7 a.m. on a Tuesday morning. <laughs> it's at reasonable times. Um, it's totally fine. And, and so we try to put that, that foot forward, starting even just with the showings. And then you have the tenant's contact information. You can also call them. In the showings, you can also pre-qualify them. We also worry about your time and wasting your time. The fact that you're not online responding to every tenant means you're busy. So also showing a property to a tenant who doesn't have your credit score and doesn't have your income to rent ratio. In other words, they don't make enough money to be able to afford your place. That's all through the pre-screening questions as they schedule a showing. But the goal is to make sure your time's not wasted and the tenant's time's not wasted and you're putting your best foot forward right off the bat to say, great, I know you're gonna be interested in viewing it you know, here, here's the calendar, because that's what majority of tenants want right off the bat. They want to see it and see if they're interested in uh, moving there. And of those, you know, an, a tenant will inquire about five properties on average, but they only take three home tours. And so you want to be one of those three. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love a couple of things you said there. You walk, and, and I'm just kind of pointing this out, I'll call yeah. it for those that are listening. If you listen to a couple, I think that are very big cues is Dana, like I'll say Hemlane, has your back in the extent that too many times, I'll call it a newbie, and even those experienced sometimes after years in the business will tend to, I don't want to say um, ignore, but certainly not prioritize those incoming calls. So Hemlane saying, I, I get it. You have a busy day. But you can't miss this lead. You, you, the reality is you don't want to miss this lead as much as you may feel that way right now. So we've got your back. We're going to make sure that we're procuring their interest. We're scheduling their interest. And I know you and I have talked and you also uh, can still work with a leasing agent. It's not like you have to do it yourself. Hemlane has it set up so you can appoint, I'll call it your favorite leasing agent, and in other words, you're keeping not only them organized, but you're keeping them prioritized on your property because you've got something simple for them to plug into. And when showings come up, they're alerted. Wouldn't you agree, um, Dana, that, that I think sometimes, at least the landlords I've dealt with, sometimes they just get a little too lax on the incoming calls 
yes. burnout, and, whatever you want to yeah. call it. And it's understandable. They have 500 emails coming in. Right. They have another job. Um, a lot of people have a, a lot of landlords have other jobs and they're like, oh, this is my weekend job. Right. Well, to the tenant, it's not your weekend job. To them, it's their home. Right. And, and so you do have to make sure that you have that level of professionalism. And like you said, Linda, um, a, a lot of people um, don't leverage and look at building a team and, and having an agent on the ground to be able to help potentially with your showings or, or increase the um, calendar time slots you have for showings. And it's okay to reach out to people. Uh, one of the biggest things that um, you and I um, both have um, said time and time again in this industry is you don't have to go it alone and you don't have to give up control. There's some in between and you can have that. You don't have to say, oh, it's do it yourself or full service. There is some in, in between and professionals in the industry love that too because they know that they're helping you and they don't have to do everything, but they can do some things that they potentially do a lot better than you. Yeah, absolutely. And as we've discussed too, there's so much, I'll call it paperwork that goes with this. And I know that um, Hemling also helps like, so we've, we, you know, we use the accounting for sure, but now you even have all the, I'll call it lease violations, lease renewals, all the things that happen at, let's call it operations, right? During the course of the lease, you know, tell me about how Hemling helps with all that. Yeah, so legal documents is one of those things where way too many people have a contract that if they ever went to court and you hope you never do, you hope you screen your screen your tenants properly, which which we do in the system. But a lot of times they'll go online and get a free lease or a lease that's old. You know, the marijuana clause is coming out in all these states. You want to make sure that you have that in your lease. Last year it might have not have been legalized, but it's legalized this year you need some sort of clause to talk about that in your lease. Now it's not up to a landlord to have to stay up to date with the laws, but it's up to the professionals in the industry to do that. Um, even at Hemling, you know, we know we're a technology company that's really good with property management end to end, but we're not lawyers. And we're not lawyers in all 50 states. And so we partnered with Rocket Lawyer on that to say, great, all of our users, they're gonna get legal documents, contracts, and from those um, lease contracts, they're able to get them by their state. Anytime the lease contract is updated, it's just updated in the Rocket Lawyer system, so the next time you go to create a lease, it has the new clauses in there. And then the language also will, you know, it, it basically puts it in layman terms, like you try to put in a late fee, and it says, well, by your state's laws, you can't put in that late fee. You know, it has to start on the third day and it can't be more than, you know, 10% of monthly rent. So they have your back in that sense. And that makes us feel good because then that contract that you have is going to be held up in court. And there's some kind of delayed and um, surprise events with that that we see. For example, they say if your tenant's late, you can report it to the credit bureaus. Well, that's something you hope you would never have to use, but it's great that your tenant just signed a lease that says that because it aligns incentives and makes sure they always pay on the first of the month, knowing their credit score could be affected if they do not. And uh, from that perspective, I really think you shouldn't have to be a professional and you shouldn't have a law degree to go into property management um, or even to own your own rental properties, but at least work with those who do on-call um, legal advice, things that you may need in times that you may need them. And uh, property management, people get emotional. Again, the communication gets disrupted and what happens is it's an emotional game. What I always recommend is always refer back to the lease because that's not emotional, that's a signed legal contract. I'm so sorry you're late on your rent. Um, per the lease contract, there is a late fee. There, no one can get emotional about that, right? That is a legally binding contract that two parties signed. And so by having a concrete lease, you can really set yourself up for success. And out of all the tenants you have, you, you probably only will have, you know, one lemon, one bad tenant that got through the background check process. But at least if you ever have that unfortunate situation, you at least have the contracts and the process in place to handle it in the best way and kind of give you that ease um, and kind of peace of mind throughout it. 
I, I think it's such a, it, honestly, it's such a wise service that Hemling um, like refers you directly to a lawyer because that way sometimes um, they do a do-it-yourself landlord does think that, you know, I go to the meetings, I attend, I know. This gives you the proper professional resource to cover right. yourself, to run things off of. I, I think that's super. Again, for those listening, you have to count that up again as a big pro. That's really super helpful. How about maintenance? How do you cover us on maintenance? How are you going to keep us uh, keep us sane with maintenance? <laughs> maintenance is one of those things. Also, I'll, I'll start with the, the legal part. So first of all, when you invest in rental properties, you shouldn't have to know maintenance. You shouldn't have to be a plumber, an electrician, and a handyman. Um, but there are, there are situations that come up of, you know, who's responsible for things, what's considered an emergency. If you ask a tenant, everything's an emergency. Right, exactly. <laughs> but what really is an emergency and then what can you take, you know, 48 hours to respond to versus what do you have to respond to that day? And um, on the maintenance side, um, we start with both setting up a process, regardless of what it is, setting up a process for success and then saying, okay, how do we reduce the number of maintenance, maintenance tickets do we have? How do we educate tenants on what is really considered an emergency versus what is not? Um, so let's just start with the first step in the process. Um, a huge mistake that um, first time landlords will make is that they'll just give the tenant the handyman's contact information. Mm -hmm. Well, that just sounds like a fantastic way for me to get a handyman to do everything in my place. You know, clean out the drains, change my light bulbs for me, um, you know, upgrade this. Or uh, another one is, you know, oh, um, this is the appliance repair company. I've approved just this request, but have this appliance repairman come out. Well, as if I'm the owner and I'm not there, the tenant is going to say, oh, well, I know that I have, you know, this refrigerator, but I kind of think that we need to upgrade to a Sub-Zero. Don't you think so? Well, for the appliance repairman, of course, they, you know, they want a new one. They get more money. <laughs> right, exactly. Oh, they, they don't need that. And so we set that up in the process. And let me give you um, some examples. Uh, you go in and you create your request, right? And the first thing says, by creating this request, you know, I give permission to enter. So you've got all that, those terms in there in case it's an emergency, as well as I'm also available to help schedule this. And if I don't show up and the service professional has a uh, no-show fee, I'm going to be charged it. So to submit the maintenance request, you have to abide by those terms or agree to those terms, I should say. Well, that will happen because one, you don't want if a tenant says this is broken and this is broken, and then you're taking, you're driving back and forth and back and forth to meet with these service professionals. And then the tenant says, oh, you didn't really fix the problem. It was actually this. Well, if the tenant has submitted a request, it's really good for them to say, yes, this has been fixed. And so it is really good to have them there during, during the process to make sure everything's checked off. Um, but if they are scheduling with the service professional and then they forget about their appointment, you shouldn't have to pay that cancellation fee. And so from that perspective, we try to put all those terms at the beginning. Then the work order. The work order is going to have the uh, owner's name on it. Um, and the work order is not shown to the tenant. And the service professional can update it. And that way, if the service professional says there's a ton of mold, there's this huge risk, yeah. it looks like there's mold, you know, the tenant's not it's thinking lawsuit, this is fantastic, that goes just to the owner. Right. But on that work order, it says, and the tenant or the service professional gets a text message or an email or both, depending on how you have it set up, and they can respond and it logs it all in that work order that's not shared with the tenant, but it will tell them, here's the scheduling contact, but here's the managed by contact or the approver. And from that perspective, it really sets up precedent of, hey, that person who's scheduling is the tenant. It even says, you know, it's the, the tenant next to it. So that's the resident. That is not the person who's paying the bill. And so a service professional will see all of the writing and the instructions saying, please call the bill to approval for approval on this. We also don't give the maintenance professional your thresholds right away, because if you say, Ooh, I'm willing to spend up to $200, but if it's over $200, then call me. I, I guarantee these service professionals are going to say, great, it was $199.99. Right. 
Yeah, every time. <laughs> every and time. so we set it up where you don't have to think about those things, but we don't want those things to go to wrong for you. And, um, and so all of that's built into the process to help you succeed where you might not know it, but if you don't have the system, it takes a couple of times of realizing, oh, wait, I should probably have a, a, a standard process in place to make this a lot easier um, for me. Uh, you know what, uh, honestly, uh, we can both, I'm sure, do a half a day session on maintenance men, repairs, and, and the, the, I'll call it kind of the war stories from the field. It's There's just so many people that are, as you said, kind of taken advantage of. They didn't have this knowledge going in. They, you know, maybe they fixed things in their, I'll call it luxury home and it, this is, you know, they got into real estate mm -hmm. investing. Now they're in, let's say, B or C class properties. And yes, that maintenance man, he, he first of all, he's a treasure when you find the right one. But mm -hmm. he can also be quite opposite, be quite the nightmare. I've been involved with too many situations where they talk. And as you said, they, they say the wrong thing. They say like, oh, there should be a new air condition here. Well, of course, you know, as you brought up, of course it should be. But anyway, I won't get on that soapbox, but yes, I, I'm so thrilled that Hemlane handles it the way it does. For all you new uh, do-it-yourself investors, Hemlane is, is more than a platform. It really is quite the educational process for you. I like what you said. It's the user experience. They're giving you an unbelievable user experience just with the benefit of their knowledge put into their software platform and working specifically for you. So, I, I mean, I can't speak highly enough, Dana. Uh, I'm so Great, thank you. <laughs> so, it what was, other features did we forget? Is there anything else that, like, what would make people want to call? I mean, what, or I shouldn't say make them want to call, but do you have some kind of a follow-up? I know you do a lot of writing, anything? Yeah, I, I do. I do a lot of, it's called the Hemlane Academy. I try to write a lot about um, things that have gone wrong. Um, large things as well as small things. Um, one of the biggest ones that we didn't talk about is Venmo and PayPal for rent collection. Oh, you should. I think that's timely right now if you could squeeze in. Yes, of course. Uh, so with Venmo and PayPal for rent collection, um, it's a great tool. As you said, Linda, you love collecting or using it with your friends when you go out to dinner and you're splitting a bill. Um, don't forget these are uh, consumer first, just like credit cards, consumer first. If someone has a complaint, because it's not a B2B um, tool, and even on the PayPal side, a lot of them, you'll try to take away that transaction fee and say it's friends and family. Well, they're gonna say, if it's friends and family, why do you have a dispute? We'll just give the money back. Um, the last thing you want is your tenant, they move out, and 30 days later, you find out that you just had $2,000 taken out of your account, and you have no recourse on that unless you go the legal route of taking them to court. Good luck finding them. They've moved somewhere else. They've changed their email and their phone number. And, um, and so from that perspective, it can be costly. You get their social security number. You go through the whole um, demand notice and stuff like that, but you just don't want to get involved in that. And so ACH transfer, bank to bank transfer is the best way to do it online. That's what we do. That's what we recommend. And um, on top of that, automatic late fees, setting that precedent, you're not the debt collector. So many people come to me and I kind of let my tenants be late. I, I let them play. Some of them pay on the 10th. Some of them pay on the 15th. They go, well, at what point do you know they're just not going to pay? They signed a contract for the first of the month. They signed a contract that on a certain date that um, it's late. And this sets a precedent that you know this person is going to pay because if you let that slide, then you become a debt collector. No one wants to become a debt collector and knock on doors. And, and that is what you become. And so setting that process up for success is something um, that also is built into the back end um, and is something that is so crucial for you to start out on the right foot that way uh, to make sure that you have things automated, streamlined, reminders going out to the tenants, and you never feel like a debt collector. You know, that's emails, Hemlane, just as a heads up tenant, your rent is late, you need to pay this. So. I, I, I love that. I really do. I think it's just, it's the whole process of understanding what's out there, being as flexible as you can be, but working within the guidelines of the lease, 
you're providing them so much. You're almost, uh, you know, you're, you're their support team. You're making sure mm -hmm. that they understand, yes, you can do that, but there's risks involved, and here's the things you, you know, let's do this. Let, I would love to know, what do you think's coming? Let's just, just, you know, the crystal ball, what's coming, what's developing in um, the management world? What are you thinking about is next, you know? And I, I know we don't know what's next. Yeah. What do you think is cool and fun and what are you thinking? Yeah, well, I think the biggest thing for small landlords that's unique and coming is something like the Airbnb experience because what you see is urbanization, everyone's moving to cities. Okay. And everything's becoming these multifamily REITs, larger developments in those cities. And they have a pool and a gym and someone to collect your Amazon packages. Well, as a smaller landlord, if you have a fourplex or even, you know, 10 units or one unit, how do you compete against them? I think it's actually based on that experience and having some sort of unique factor. I always say, do you want to live next, live at a place that looks just like your neighbors in this huge, uh, you know, um, building that has 550 units? Or do you want a unique, you know, experience where it's a quaint, it's different. It's like that Airbnb thing where you go in and you're like, whoa, this place is cool. And they, you know, they have the swing and the hammock. Right. Um, not to say that a landlord would have that, but I think experience is the next thing that's coming as people are moving to cities. If you have uh, a place in the suburbs, the outskirts of the cities, or even if you're fortunate enough to have one in these cities, how do you provide an experience where when someone comes and looks at your place, they go, wow, I, I want to be here. And so that experience, I think, is the next thing that we'll see where people start putting tenants first and thinking of tenants as, their, as, as a customer, not as this inconvenience of someone who puts in maintenance requests and asks to pay rent late. Um, it, will, it will change and, and you want to keep those best tenants. And so you'll start thinking about the paint colors and what are some of those unique things in the kitchen doorknobs or whatever that don't make it out, outrageous that no one wants it, but makes it unique and someone feels like, okay, this is mine. I, I have a couple of stories to go with that. The one I'm just going to tell really quick, but we have a lady out here in um, a part of Chicago. She's in our meetings all the time. Anyway, she has what she calls vintage units. I don't want to take away your time. Okay. But yeah. They're so clever. They stand out. And I just have to say this, it's just ironic. And all the men in the group are so like, uh, I'll, I'll use the word uh, jealous. They tease her all the time because they're like, she is getting the highest rents and she has the less amount, the least amount of things. To mm -hmm. She doesn't have a dishwasher because it's an experience. It's vintage. It's um, old mm -hmm. tiles. It's all this. Fair, and she attracts like a very a certain, I'll call it lifestyle person. And I am so big on that, that I wrote an article on that. I believe it's so true that it, it's not, you know, the color of the cabinets, it's the experience. What can you sell them? What is your neighborhood like? How well mm -hmm. do you know that neighborhood? Like, let them share in that passion of, mm -hmm. this is so cool because I can get here, I can get there, you know, whatever. The coffee shop down the block is just perfect to sit in, you know. Exactly. Yep, and you'll see that with smaller complexes, people talk to their neighbors more. Second, there's the elevator and the doorman. For some reason, everyone's just on their phones. Right. In the elevator, it's so weird. I, you could even do an experiment. Go to your friend's place that has one of those and then go to a smaller place and, you know, a 16 unit and you'll see everyone knows each other and they talk and it's a different experience from that perspective. And, and being able to sell that um, is, is huge this day and age because that's what people want. That's why people move even to cities is they, they want more of an experience. They want to be around people and, 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 and be able to go home and talk about something um, to their parents, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Anything else, Dana? Anything else uh, you want to share? I'm so, we feel so fortunate. First off, why don't you give your contact information just so we don't get cut off? I want to be sure everybody knows how to reach you. Yes. So you can reach me at Dana, D-A-N-A -A, at Hemlane, H-E-M-L-A-N-E dot -E com. And, um, oh, I should give you a background just very quickly. Hemling, Hem is house in Swedish, and we wanted an international feel, um, so to take um, house and home from another language so that it wasn't just something that was specific to the U.S., um, but what had a bit of an international feel. And then the lane, 
a lane is like a path, right, that divides you from others. We wanted a home experience that divided you from others, both from the tenants as well as the uh, owners and the landlords experience. So that's where the name came from. Um, so you can reach me at Dana at hemlane.com. You can also just visit our website, www.hemlane.com. Uh, and then if you're looking for more resources and content, you can go to resources.hemlane.com or just type in the Hemlane Academy into Google and that will show up and that has um, content and uh, just certain things that you may not know that um, would be really helpful with your day-to-day -day management. Well, we are so fortunate to have you. I know every member, I will do my best to get this information out to all the members. I'm in a lot of a, a local, regional, different real estate investment groups, and I think it's really important that they know their solutions that are really tailored for you know the do-it-yourself investor that's trying to go it alone and needs a little support. Great. Well, thanks so much, Linda, for having me. This was wonderful. And I'm really impressed with also the community you've created here. I, I do think this is very much needed. So All right. Thank you. Well, thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Sure.